So good morning, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about how cryptococcosis presents in patients. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a fungus that we breathe in and can cause just pulmonary disease, but also can disseminate to other parts of the body, and therefore it has quite a broad clinical presentation. Um, what I want to do first is to talk about those cl different clinical manifestations and how it presents. Um, and the first, um, the, f the, the, the different parts of the way that this organism presents includes uh, brain disease, which is perhaps the commonest, but also causes skin disease, and you can see a rather unusual form of scleral disease in the eye here, and it can also cause endophthalmitis, although that's also quite rare. Um, some patients have just pulmonary disease, as we'll talk about, and some have pulmonary plus brain disease, and this depends partly on whether you have HIV or you don't have HIV. And you also get relatively silent sites, uh, forms of infection, such as uh, prostate infection or bone and joint infection, which can be quite chronic and indolent in different ways. And the immunocompromised state of the patient also affects how it presents clinically. So we breathe cryptococcus in. It's particularly related to pigeon or bird excreta, but there's a ver another variety related to eucalyptus trees. And most patients just handle this organism and kill it in the lung and it doesn't do anything. Sometimes it goes on and causes pulmonary infection. And you can see an example here on this chest X-ray with a, a large nodule or, or mass in the right apex. And that's the commonest presentation in the lungs is a simple nodule. Um, but you can have bilateral disease and cavitating nodules as well, particularly in patients who are somewhat immunocompromised. Some of the patients with these pulmonary nodules are completely normal immunologically, and we don't really understand why some patients get disease and some don't. What is clear is that the diagnosis cannot be made with cryptococcal antigen on blood testing. Um, and so this is a negative test. In some patients, um, bronchoalveolar lavage grows the organism, and you can also detect uh, as, uh, cryptococcus by, with PCR or with uh, galactomannan. So the pulmonary presentations vary between immunocompetent and immunocompromised. So in the immunocompetent patients, you get cough, you get the production of sputum in some patients, and sometimes pleuritic chest pain. Um, and then occasionally you get low-grade fever or shortness of breath, uh, weight loss, and malaise. So this is not a very distinctive clinical presentation, and nor is the radiology. So it's often quite a difficult diagnosis, and because it's uncommon, therefore it's often missed and not diagnosed. In the immunocompromised patient, it's part of a more serious illness. So you have fever, you have quite a lot of cough, dyspnea, uh, and headache, which is usually a manifestation of meningitis, is also present in many of these patients. Some patients lose weight. And then much less commonly, you get pleuritic chest pain, hemoptysis, uh, crackles or rales in the lung or a pleural rub. And occasionally it presents as an ARDS, sort of overwhelming um, uh, respiratory failure syndrome, just as histoplasmosis and other, and, and blastomycosis can, can present. Um, the, um, these are the different radiological features which you get uh, in the lungs. Um, so this is an example of an area of consolidation of the right uh, mid-zone. But you can get granulomas, you can get Apache pneumonitis, you can get cavitation, you can get mediastinal adenopathy, you can have one or more nodules, and then you can have these nondescript pulmonary infiltrates Rarely it causes a pleural effusion, but that is well reported. And occasionally you can get a Miller-like disease similar to that like, of TB. And these are just some examples. So looking at the x-rays, the nodule is the, perhaps the most, or, or large nodule is probably the most common manifestation, but it's fairly broad. And then cryptococcus can get travel to the brain. Um, it does this, it's a silent bloodstream infection, so it, it, and it isn't clear why some patients get this and some don't. So, and the, the brain infection can be a meningitis, a pure meningitis. You can have a meningoencephalitis with involvement in other parenchymal parts of the brain and disordered thinking. And you can have a mass lesion, which is otherwise known as a, uh, a cryptococcoma. 
And these symptoms are usually subacute or chronic, um, occurring over several weeks. If you have HIV infection, it's sort of one to three weeks time frame. If you don't have um, HIV infection and are no, uh, quotes normal immunologically, then it can actually be weeks or months. And occasionally present, patients present with hydrocephalus, uh, obstructive hydrocephalus, which is a, a, a problem. You can see the, um, the parenchymal mass that's this cryptococcoma on the right hand side of this, uh, these, uh, CT, this MR uh, scan here of the brain. So these patients develop a, a high intracranial pressure, so they become um, slightly confused. They will get papilledema in their brain, in their eyes, for example. And if you do a lumbar puncture, they have high intracranial pressures and very high antigen titers, particularly immunocompromised patients. There are some patients with not immunocompromised with low antigen titers, but high pressure. And that's a, a, probably an inflammatory response. And occasionally you can get cranial nerve disorders, this craniopathies, um, but it's not very common. But it's much more common with Cryptococcus gatti, which is the variety of um, Cryptococcus you catch from eucalyptus trees and tends to occur in non-immunocompromised patients. So these patients present with headache, fever, slow thinking, occasional cranial nerve palsies, neck stiffness, coma. Sometimes they come in unconscious and lethargy. And, the, uh, and sometimes they're confused. Often they have nausea and vomiting, and that's particularly associated with intracranial pressure. Obtundation, which is another form of confusion. Um, blurred vision, photophobia and diplopia. In fact, photophobia, which is common in general bacterial meningitis, is uncommon in cryptococcal disease. And then you can have some more severe effects like hearing defects seizures, ataxia, aphasia, and abnormal movements. But all of those features are quite rare. So uh, here's an, another one. If you look at patients presenting with AIDS in, um, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, you get headache is very common. Meningism is less common, but is there if you look for it. That's a stiff neck or detection of stiff neck. Only half the patients had fever. Um, half the patients complained of a stiff neck. Vomiting is a fairly common and less common you can see is photophobia, altered mental status, seizures are uncommon but serious when they occur and focal deficits are also fairly uncommon. Um, if you look at in France uh, for example you get a similar picture um, um, but perhaps a slightly higher incidence of cranial nerve deficits uh, and change, uh, change in mental status. Um, and in a different, more recent paper, you can see in HIV positive and HIV negative patients that fever's a bit more common in HIV, meningism is definitely more common in HIV, but abnormal neurology is, is equally found in the two groups of patients. So crypto can also disseminate from the lungs to the skin, and the skin is the third most common site of infection. Um, very rarely you can get a pure skin infection, but it is really, really, really rare. So, and it looks like molluscum contagiosum, and you can see the lesions here with these um, uh, raised edges with a, like an ulcer in the middle of them. Um, and, but you can have other forms, and you can have subcutaneous nodules which don't ulcerate through the skin as well. And if you're looking at examining patients who might have cryptococcus, it's important to feel their skin to check that they don't have a, 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 a subcutaneous nodule under the skin. And this is particularly caused by a group, what was called serotype D strains, which are part of the Neoformans Grubii uh, group. And it, clinically, these look very like what you would get hist histoplasmosis as well. Um, and, and so a biopsy is required really to know what the diagnosis is if it isn't apparent from a, a cryptococcal antigen testing. And, and that's how you would make this diagnosis is with doing a skin biopsy. Prostate involvement is um, fairly common in AIDS and it's often asymptomatic and it provides a nidus for subsequent relapse. So one of the reasons after we get a patient better from cryptococcal meningitis, we have to continue with longer term therapy, is to make sure they don't get a relapse um, with this. And if you want to make that diagnosis, you have to take a urine sample or seminal fluid to actually grow cryptococcus 
from, from it. Then you have these rarer manifestations of eye disease, um, and you can see ocular palsies, papilledemas, moderately common in patients with cryptococcal meningitis, and that can go on to visual loss, which is really quite serious. Here's an example also of chorioretinitis, which is a rare manifestation of the disease. Um, and you can also get optic nerve direct invasion, or you can get high pressure, which causes visual loss. And then you can, outside the eye and the skin and the brain and the lungs, you can get osteomyelitis, which is uncommon, bone marrow, peritonitis, other parts of the genital urinary tract, occasionally adrenal involvement, occasionally myositis, occasionally hepatitis. All of these things are rare, but part of a, a disseminated illness. So in summary, cryptococcus affects most organ systems in the human host. The lungs and the brain are the most common sites, the skin the third most common site, and some immune privilege sites, such as the prostate, are a potent nidus for, for relapse. Thank you very much. Thank you.